This is the weekend I planned to be in Prague. It's funny what life deals you. Almost miraculously, I finally made it to Skopje. It's a cool spring evening and I'm collecting my thoughts between the sounds of nightingales and NATO planes. Strange evening companions. It feels surreal being here, so close and so far away. It feels terribly calm and I feel like I'm operating in a parallel universe to my normal life, whatever that is. It seems calm enough and yet horrific atrocities are supposedly occurring 20 kilometers away. When I came here, I was heading the assessment mission to have a look at the scenario here with, the, with a group of people, but very quickly it became apparent that there would be a need for us to get involved. Um, and so I, I came, I moved from being head of the assessment mission to being head of CARES operation here because I was the most, uh, the person who was here at the time that could take over that role. I guess that was about uh, exactly five weeks ago um, from today. And then the whole thing's happened in the last five weeks. <laughs> Everything that's gone on, it's been, an, it's been an enormous, biggest five weeks of my life, I think. Tonight I had the feeling of having a panic attack. It was horrible. I've calmed down now, but I felt as though the weight of the world was on my shoulders and it was more responsibility than I could bear at that moment. Things are very difficult at the camp and we need about 10 more pairs of hands. Two days ago, I got a call from Care Australia and they asked me if I could go to Macedonia in two days' time. On Wednesday they said I might be going, um, Thursday they told me I'd definitely be going if I could go on Saturday. Yeah, it's the first time I've had a chance to actually do something like this. I mean, you, you watch it on TV and it just, I, before 10 days ago I'd never even thought about it. head for Macedonia, NATO is fending off widespread criticism of its latest system. A couple of guys from uh, Care Australia gave us a briefing. I, uh, I suppose I became nervous for about five minutes when they were telling us the situation over there and, and the situation with the, um, the two care workers that are uh, hostage at the moment. The problem is that um, our flight coming in has uh, been late and uh, we've missed our connecting flight from uh, Frankfurt to Vienna. You've won a trip too. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Carbon. Carbon. Thank you. Hi, you. Stevenson. Gardner. Joe. Mark Rookie. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Gary Taylor, Joe. How are you? They'll get here. And I, I think instantaneously there's a shock factor and that's the aim of trying to give people a good talk when they come and explain this is the situation, this is what's going on, this is who I am, this is who everybody else is and this is how you'll fit into the, to the grand picture. Welcome, all of you, Thank you. Thank to this you. fantastic and exciting mission. <clears throat> I know some of you have worked with CARE before and some haven't. This mission is uh, an emergency mission, and for what that means, it means that we're in a state of constant transition. So everything I tell you may change tomorrow, um, and the thing that I ask the most from everybody, and I say this up front, is that everyone try to learn to be as flexible and adaptable as possible, and I know most people are. Um, it's important that you be understanding about things if you're told things one day and then the next day it changes, that you're willing to kind of go with the flow. You've come to probably one of the most um, fascinating and complex. Two or three weeks ago when we first were asked by the United Nations to take on a camp and we didn't really have enough staff here. There were days that I woke up feeling quite sick, thinking this is an enormous uh, task that's been required of us and of me. Um, and, and, you know, I'd stop and think, well, I don't know how I ended up here. I'm, I'm 26, I'm a girl from Melbourne and uh, I just came over here to try something out new for, for a year. I uh, moved, moved out of my other, my other job and suddenly I find myself in this scenario. We're only about 20 kilometres from the border to Kosovo here. The border is to keep going on this road and you'll be there in about 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes. Yeah. So, you can see the camp over there. I don't think we'll be getting any more people in this camp, although we say that every day and every day we get more people, but uh, there really isn't anywhere else for them to go now. 
So um, theoretically we won't be getting any more, but you just can't be sure. That's the kind of bus that goes to the border, empty, and it comes back full of refugees. So here's our, our French friends, and these are the care accommodation tents just here too. There's the care car, and there's all the care workers in their little green vests. Okay. <laughs> how are you? Good yes. to see you too, Andrew. <laughs> Margaret, how are you? Good, how are you? Fine, I'm having a holiday. It's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, I have some yeah. trips for you. Okay. This is Bob. Good. 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 We have some buses Good. arriving. Yes. yes. And you got some gravel. occasions that we've got buses in the day. The rest of the time they come at night. Don't ask me why. There seems to be a great delight in releasing people from the border at 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night. So you get the buses here at 1, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. We unload them one at a time. Get some water in them. Get the driver to open up the door, get some water, a bit of bread if you've got a bit of bread, something to eat, and then close the door in it. Don't let them off. Because once you let them off, you lose complete control over it because uh, usually when a bus comes in here, everybody runs from anywhere in the camp to find it. Where did they come from? Is there anybody on there that they know? <laughs> Peter, again, there's 17 more people coming off the next bus, so there's going to be a gap. It's amazing, but uh, it's so much easier to do it the first one we're doing in the daylight because it'll make it easier for us when the buses come in the night, but I'd hate to be doing this in the middle of the night. <laughs> I don't think you can imagine what it's like until you actually get here and see what it's like and see what the people are like and uh, and then we had a quick quick briefing and um, the buses were turning up so in a way it was good we got dropped in the deep end so it's good uh, we were really pleased that we managed to do it um, yeah. go and find out what we're going to do tonight now so. I say that energy level probably lasts for about two to three days because um, it's still quite, quite exciting, it's all very new. Um, they're a bit uncertain about what they're supposed to do, but you know, they learn to fit in. Then I think as tiredness starts to hit, um, after the first two, three, four days perhaps, then people tend to go into a bit more of a lull again. And um, they know now what it is, they know th what this job is, and they're trying to figure out whether they can cope with it and whether they'll last. It looks like the Holocaust on TV, and it's hard to take in all of this, the enormity of the situation, and what this could mean for humanity. Tonight I've taken on another camp at the request of the UN and called for immediate staff reinforcements. It'll stretch our capacity a lot now, but someone has to do the job, and few if any other NGOs have put up their hands. about an 80 to 90% Albanian community down there. They were very welcoming of us. Whereas Stankovic is, is in an area which is largely, um, it's right near the border, but it's mostly um, Serbian and ethnic Macedonian farmers in there. And are not very comfortable at the camps expanding. Uh -huh. 
Well, the situation at the moment is that we, we've got this new camp that we're trying to set up, so they've asked me to go down there this afternoon with Marge and go sit in on some meetings. They've started putting some tents up, um, so they expect refugees to be dumped on them very, very shortly. Um, so they, want, they don't want to get stuck in the same situation as what happened here. But the situation here is what we've been working on for the last two days, is they've had, say, five buses a day coming in here, which is probably two, three hundred people. But today we've been told we, we have to take 2,000 more people. Um, if they dump 2,000 on us today, there's no way we can put them under shelter. Uh, I think the way things are going, they're going to move people into the new camp very soon. So we need to kind of get a handle on that one too. How soon soon? Well, you know. End of the week, tomorrow? I think, well, Friday they said. Yep, I'll drive but I can't in. find Marg now. Where would she right. be? Can I also ask about this uh, 2,000 more people? This afternoon, I think. That's why I'm only taking two people away from the camp. Yeah. I was going to take four, but I'm going to take two now. Well, hopefully we'll be back in time and they won't have arrived. So. No, hopefully. So you better go. Um, have a look for Marg up and down the corridors. You don't see it and just go, I think. 2,000. Um, your coat, your coat. Oh, yes. <laughs> a thousand each. Right? <laughs> She'll be right. Yeah, no see worries. You Sit here and we'll move his, uh, his bags last. In my previous experience, I haven't been as immersed in the urgency as I'm seeing today. Um, there, there have been times when it's been quite chaotic in, in, in the past, but I mean, the, 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 the enormity of this situation is something that's, that's quite, quite new to me. <laughs> Yeah, there's 12 more buses coming. What? Well, I think they think a lot of sleeping bags are going to clog up the tents, but it's not quite clear. I'm not quite understood that there's actually 12 more buses coming. So they'll be used up you know, probably within the hour or two, at least before the evening's out. But we need them actually stationed here for when the people come in. And I've just unloaded about 900 of them about an hour ago, so I'm not looking forward to this one bit. Richard Gear should have stayed to help me unload them. I think the emotion is at the moment. And then you've just got to say, well, I can't, you know, shed a tear all day. I've got to get that out of the way so I can get on and, and help. And I think we're all handling that. Yesterday was very emotional. There was a lot of women yesterday that were just uh, literally not on this planet. They were so stressed out that it was really sad. We were expecting 20 buses and it just seems that 21's turned up and it was... Uh, incredibly hectic squeeze to, to make room for the, the 2,000 people we were expecting. So in the very last minute we're going to have to squeeze 100 odd extra people into the tents. And the tents were squashed at 80 and I think we were packing at 110 just then. God be willing that the 21 buses are, are it. Um, hopefully it might be over in an hour, an hour and a half. But um, fingers crossed. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, I know, you're trying to get him to close it. I don't know what the count is now. Is the doctor? Please, move, move, go through. Well, we have two more buses unloading at eight, so I'd like to do is take one of your doctors. You will be okay. Yeah. No, stay there and bring the buses back. No, there's no room left in that tent, mate. We'll take them to another tent and then we'll bring them back.
The situation is rapidly deteriorating and it sounds pretty shocking in Albania. Huge numbers of refugees. How and where to put them, nobody seems to know. There's some news tonight that the Russian Prime Minister may have had successful talks with Milosevic. I feel strange today, like this whole experience has begun to grow in on me, like I'm in a vacuum. I'm trying to figure out what this operation is in the uncertain situations. Since I left you yesterday, I've arrived at this new camp at about um, two o'clock yesterday afternoon, and it was there was nobody here. We were trying to set it up, and we expected refugees in on Friday. We came down here to have a meeting, and that's all we thought we were going to do. They told us that uh, yesterday afternoon to expect anywhere between a thousand and five thousand people last night, and all afternoon the rumours kept going back and forth and back and forth, and we never knew. So three of us from CARE stayed here all night, and we worked with all the um, the organisations here to try and get it ready. It wasn't ready, but. Uh, 27 buses turned up uh, at 11 o'clock last night and we finished putting them into tents at um, about 7.30 this morning. I haven't slept yet. I've been on my feet now for 30 hours, I'm not making much sense, but um, I mean, it's really what emergency work is all about and you've got to get in there and you do your bit and I mean it was great. I mean, it's the same in any emergency situation. I mean, I think everybody just gets in there and we couldn't have done it without the um, German NATO forces. I mean, they were fantastic. Last night, I was riding on a, one of these giant NATO forklifts and I was really thinking, I cannot believe I'm here doing this because two weeks ago, I'd never even thought of doing aid work. And I, and I was truly believing that I've never done something so satisfying in my life. I, I think I'm going to be here for a while doing this. A couple of weeks ago, I was watching television in Balmain, Sydney, and now I'm uh, giving German NATO forces their, their instructions and, uh, and helping uh, 5,000 refugees. people have come from fairly tragic circumstances but they've come to something that is safe and secure they know that people are here helping them they're not being going to be pushed out of here in any great hurry i've just come from a meeting we've just been told to expect four and a half to five thousand refugees later this afternoon there is absolutely no way we can take that many the government's just sending them to us uh, we're trying to we're trying to delay it uh, we don't have the tents for them um, the camp's just going to be overrun before we have any proper infrastructure. Um, so that's the very latest situation. People can talk to you about figures and they can tell you that there's 10,000 people waiting, 5,000 people waiting, but it's hard for a, an ordinary person to visualise what 10,000 people looks like queued up at a border. Or, or how do you fit 10,000 people into buses? And it's not until you stand there in the middle of the camp on a day when refugees are arriving and you watch busload after busload after busload, each bus carrying somewhere between 60 and 100 people on it, packed to the hilt, that you can actually get a sense of just the enormity of the numbers of people coming through. I'm concerned about the welfare of the staff tonight, particularly the field staff and the new arrivals most of all. Everyone's looking pretty haggard and sunburnt and I think everyone needs some time off. At my request, eight new staff are arriving in three days, which is a relief. Um, what happened to my head? It's, it looks a lot worse than it is, to start with. I got on a bus today, or jumped on a bus with an interpreter to um, get some refugees off, and hit my head on the top of the door jam, and I did it in front of um, a film crew, <laughs> so I think it's gone out on the world and uh, it started to bleed and that was the most embarrassing thing because I kept doing my job and uh, the refugees started looking at me with worried looks on their face so uh, and they're going oh poor poor man oh, Lord. And, uh, 
So I, I could see the headline saying something like uh, refugee comforts aid worker in, in refugee camp. So. Good morning. How is it? All right. Okay. Last night. Okay. No, no. Come on. That was a bit chaotic. So, a bit. So <laughs> And there's so much to be done, especially with summer coming and sanitation's got to become a big problem. The people from Kosovo themselves helping with the, the French emergency services, the French engineers. This is the closest you get to a real sense, a real deep sense of humanity. The whole spread, the best and the worst. It's just really raw and in your face. The French troops have been absolutely magnificent. I mean, that's living, bordering on awe-inspiring how they've just let to it and gone in efficiently done the job but still with obvious compassion uh, French staff organized with the refugees a big challenge challenge of the soccer uh, so Sunday uh, big challenge on the top in this camp so this is this is a goal goal for the uh, the goal post hat off to him if I was wearing one I think it amazes me, you know, as a young woman standing here in 1999 to look around and think, you know, where are all these going to go? How, how will this all ever get solved? What will ever happen to Kosovo? And what will happen to these people? Well, this morning we've opened up the mother and child centre. And we have a problem. Everybody wants something straight away. They think there won't be enough, but there's plenty of everything. It's just a matter of being able to hand it out in an in a orderly sort of fashion. It is certainly a life that's very much on the edge and the unpredictability of every day for us here and the changing tide of, of the needs and the emergency are something that, that keeps your blood pumping in your veins. It, it's something that keeps your heart ticking and get, getting you up every day. I'm yelling at everybody. I'm losing my voice. But you have to ask yourself how long you can do that and remain a normal human being. Funnily enough, I'm probably slightly less of a misanthrope than I came in, actually. I've had thought about this, and the reason this is here, and these people have, are going through such um, quite terrible circumstances, is because of you know, the actions of others. But I've thought about it, it's actually the, the actions of um, quite a, f a few others. Not that many people have caused this much misery, but then you have this many people who are just getting on with it and actually conducting themselves. I mean, dang, dignity is a word that comes to mind. I, I think I'm actually slightly less of a myth and throat. And hot dang, I wasn't expecting that. Actually, quite a bit more um, pride of my fellow human beings. I think that's a very wonderful thing to come out of it. <laughs>
it's moments like today when you see a soccer match between the French soldiers in our camp against the Albanian refugees and you watch the excitement and joy on their faces. It makes you realise that there is hope here, there is a reason to go on, there is a reason that we are here helping these people. Most of the time you just plug on and, and do what you've got to do and you're driven by the, the, by the whatever it is that drives us to do this sort of work. Um, but there are moments that you stop and you think, why am I doing this? This tide of humanity exercised from a land that many are likely never to return to, Kosovo. I got emotional tonight trying to explain the situation to family and friends on email and not knowing how to say what I'm going through and what I'm seeing. It's difficult to look beyond what's happening each day, but I'm simultaneously driven by a desire to help these people as fast as possible.